1. Just to give a little background, I've been getting sleep paralysis ever since I was in kindergarten. It's actually one of my earliest memories as a kid. The feeling of waking up paralyzed, trying to scream for help, has always been awful, but I am thankful my experiences never had demons and scary things like most people. I've received sleep paralysis so many times for years and years. I've actually gotten very good at breaking them fast and gaining movement of my body. There was this one time the craziest thing happened, though. So my best friend died recently, prior to the experience. It was traumatizing. The endless thought of why and what's the meaning of life, if my best friend is taken, got to me. Out of desperation, I tried to read the Bible before sleeping. I'm not a fan of organized religion, and think most of it is a scam, but I was desperate to find answers. I got to about five pages into reading it before my eyes got tired and I fell asleep. It must have been ten minutes after falling asleep I wake up, unable to move. I thought to myself, great, sleep paralysis again. But wait a minute, where the hell is that green light coming from? My room is always pitch black. I look at the corner of my eye and you wouldn't believe it. I see a green oval vortex spinning counterclockwise. It was about four feet tall and two to three feet wide, hovering about a foot above the ground. It was like a portal to another world. I panic and struggle for about five to ten seconds before breaking out of the vortex's grip. I shot up in bed, breathing heavily, wide awake. There was no way in hell I was dreaming. I'm now looking straight into the soul of this vortex. All of a sudden I get this telepathic message. It was like this thing was talking to me, inside my brain. It said, You weren't supposed to do that. As soon as I received that message, a small bee-sized orb popped out of the vortex, vibrating at a low frequency before it started coming closer and closer to me. Then all of a sudden, it went straight through my forehead, or third eye, knocking me out unconscious. I fell straight back into bed from my sitting position, passing out just like that. I woke up what seems like another ten minutes later, freaked the hell out. I threw the covers over my head and just begged to fall asleep and wake up when the sun came up. I was terrified to be in that dark room alone. I've discussed this in some paranormal groups, and some people have experienced the same thing. They've even finished parts of my story before I could, so I know they weren't lying. I wondered what it meant, and why it happened. 2. I am a female, and I was 22 when this occurred. I was living in a largely rural town in Alberta. Every summer, the town would be the host of a very popular country music festival. Country music really isn't my thing, so I never imagined going. Basically, over the weekend, most of the people attending this festival camp out on the grounds of the venue, some with RVs, lots with tents. There were more expensive private camp lots with amped up security, but in the general area. Security was more sparse. The grounds were literally just fields some distance outside of town, so it was common for people who didn't have tickets to try to sneak in, namely at night. It was my best friend's birthday party. I threw him a murder mystery dinner party, and then we all had drinks after. Very fortunately, considering the events later on, I think we ate enough to prevent us from getting drunk, despite the massive amounts of alcohol we were consuming, with dinner and in a shot wheel game. I had my two friends at the party, Laura and Surya, who were more acquaintances of my best friend. So when my best friend's family started arriving, and it was about 10 o'clock, I decided to head out with these two friends. 
The previous night we had checked out the festival, as Lara knew some people who had tickets too and were camping out at the festival. And they had asked her to come visit. Surya and I found it boring though, and weren't dressed for the setting, muddy fields. And so we ended up walking back into town, which took approximately an hour. So this night we agreed to go back to check out the festival. But if there was nothing to do, we would again leave. We took a cab there, and again jumped the barbed wire. We wandered around a little. Lara couldn't find her friends and came across a few people from town we knew. And we stumbled upon a little rave. That was a blast. But it got shut down pretty suddenly. And once the DJs knew they weren't restarting it, Surya and I decided we wanted to go. Lara didn't want to join us. She had just found her friends, so we agreed to separate. Surya and I started making our way off the grounds, pretty confident from the night before that we knew the way. But this time, because we had explored the festival grounds a lot more, we were departing from a totally different point. When we dodged security successfully and made it off the grounds, we weren't quite sure of the direction to go. We seemed to be at the opposite end of the ground from the previous night, so we guessed. We made our way along the highway and realized we were extremely far from town. We were concerned, but we still kept going, and fortunately, after over half an hour, we came upon the casino. That was at least a landmark we knew, but we were still very far from town. I don't know why we didn't call a cab from the casino looking back. That would have made the most sense, but we didn't. We passed it and continued into town. We finally came to the first streets on the outskirts, where on one side of the highway there were a couple of abandoned little farmhouses, and on the other the truck stop and Tim Hortons. Surya and I decided we were going to go to Tim Hortons eat and call a cab, because there was still more than an hour of walking to do, at least, to get to our places, and we weren't familiar with the upcoming residential area. So we went in, ordered food, and I called a cab. The operator gave us a ten minute wait, the usual time to wait in this town. We took turns using the washroom and waited. One customer had entered as we waited probably about ten minutes after our call. He was a man in upper middle age, really average looking. He ordered coffee and sat down. We decided to look outside to check for our cab. It was in the parking lot. As it turned out, the middle aged customer was our cab driver. And the cab was the only vehicle in the lot. Odd. We approached him and reminded him we called. And he was friendly, but seemed strangely like he didn't expect us to request that we go to our destination. He was just sitting, drinking his coffee, not even looking at us until we approached. We all left the Tim Hortons, and we gave him Surya's address. We lived on the same street. He seemed friendly, but then we realized after about five to ten minutes of driving that we were not going in a familiar area at all. We maybe thought that this was just a more uncommon route, and I even wondered if he was taking longer to raise the fare. He was taking what seemed to be a lot of unnecessary turns, and driving in very weird patterns. He was taking a route that just didn't make sense. Maybe it was solely to raise the fare, and that is the only thing that happened with this taxi ride, and nothing sinister was going on at all. Yet, the atmosphere changed at this point. All of a sudden, he didn't seem friendly, and instead turned into a really suspicious and shady character, like he was planning something, or had something in mind, and was waiting for a certain action or response from us to set things in motion. He suddenly slowed down to almost a roll, and stopped in a residential area, not in front of any actual house or building, but rather a large cluster of trees and bushes. So that were we to exit the cab, we would have to go through shadows and past all the dark tall trees, 
before getting to any of the houses. He insisted we were at our destination. We denied it, and told him this was not where we had asked to go. He tried to insist again that we were at the right place, but we didn't move and told him that this wasn't the right place. He paused, silent for a noticeable moment, and then asked us for the address again, and said sorry for getting lost, and said that he didn't know the area very well. Fortunately, without speaking to each other, Surya and I both knew that we would give him neither of our addresses. We gave him the address of a street by our university. But... That was a street or two away from ours. Immediately he turned around and drove straight there. No weird routes, no confusion. He knew the street exactly that we asked for. And the quickest way to get there. This was just one street over from where we originally gave. And the streets are numbered in this area. So he couldn't have simply not known our street location while knowing this one. We arrived within five minutes, and we both hopped out of his cab, and set our fare, which was actually not above the usual cost, on the front seat beside him. We stood under the street light on the corner of the street, and he slowly, again almost just rolling, drove off. He drove very slowly the whole time, and we just stood there. He finally arrived at where he would have to turn, hesitated for a moment, and finally drove away at normal speed. We waited just a little to ensure that he was really gone, and we quickly made our way to our houses. We both felt so weird after it. At the time, we never really thought of anything or wondered about it, or guessed about what was going on. We both just felt like something was definitely wrong, and that we needed to get away from him with as little trouble as possible. Later, I wondered more about it. All I ever really theorized, though, was that maybe, since we gave one address and had probably, though I do forget this detail, hesitated a little when we initially gave him the address, trying to choose which of ours to give. He could have thought that we were going to some sort of party or after-party, to a place we weren't familiar with. If that was the case excluding the possibility he was genuinely lost. Though he seemed to suddenly know his whereabouts when we told him he took us to the wrong place. He maybe was trying to take advantage of us, perhaps not going to a familiar place, bringing us somewhere completely different and very dark and isolated. Then the question would be, if he really did have a perception of us as going somewhere unfamiliar and brought us intentionally to a different place, what were his intentions? And what could have happened if we had exited the cab at the first address? Or if we had been drunk? Also, when I did get home, I saw Tim Hortons gave me the wrong food. 3. So I caught myself thinking of the house I grew up in today. I'm from a small town in Texas, and I haven't lived in that house for 10 years. That house had something evil in it. I was told stories as a child about the strange things that would happen in that house. I was told stories about cabinet doors opening by themselves. Or hearing people opening doors while you sleep. I come from a broken family. My parents split up when I was 11. I was sent to live with my grandmother. It seems as the years progressed... The activity in my grandmother's house got worse every year. The first four years that I lived there is when things started for me. I would be getting ready for bed and feel someone staring at me. As I was getting comfortable and snug in bed, my bed would move as if someone just sat down on the edge. There was not a lot I could do. Just pull the covers over my head and hope that they wouldn't touch me. I cried the first time it happened. I guess after a while, I got used to it. Moving ahead a few years, I believe I was 17. My cousin, we'll call him Tommy, 
and I were outside doing yard work. We noticed flies around the house. I don't mean like we saw two or three flies. This was a swarm of flies like something was dead nearby. Tommy and I told Nanny about the infestation. The only thing we could do was buy outdoor fly traps. We bought six of them, six one-quart bags. The first one we hung out in the front yard. The next day it was full. This went on for weeks. After a month or so, the fly problem died down. But after that is when the chaos started. At night I would hear someone in the kitchen messing with the glasses in the cabinet, and turning on the faucet like they were getting something to drink. I knew no one was awake. Other nights my closet door would open by itself. Mind you, this was not a regular door. It was an accordion door. So wind opening it is out of the question. One night I was alone. It was late at night and I was thirsty. My room is at the end of a long hallway that leads into the living room and kitchen. Right in front of my door on the ceiling was the entrance to the attic. There wasn't a pull-down ladder, only a piece of cardboard painted the same color as the ceiling. I already had the feeling as if someone was watching me. I slowly opened my door to go to the kitchen. As soon as I stepped under the attic opening, the cardboard pressed down as if someone was on top of it. I ran as fast as I could to the kitchen. I got a glass of tea and ran back to my room. The cardboard did the same thing. After a while, I had finished my tea and had to use the bathroom. I poked my head out of my door and noticed the cardboard bending down. I ran to the kitchen and grabbed a broom, came back and poked through the cardboard with the handle of the broom. I hit something and ran into my room. The next morning I got a ladder and moved the cardboard out of the way. There was nothing on top or around it. In fact, our attic was empty. Over the next two years, random things would happen. Stuff would move on its own. We would all see shadows. Too many of those stories to count. Doors opening, etc. One story that, well, somewhat happened to me. My father had made a pretty cool candle that was in a glass jar and had an eagle that hung off of the side. It used to sit on top of the TV in the living room. One morning I woke up and opened the door separating the living room from the hallway. The candle was right in front of the door, almost like it had fallen off and rolled over. I thought to myself, man, that's pretty far for it to roll. I picked it up and put it back on the TV and went on with my day. The next night I was staying with my best friend, but I got to hear what happened the next day. My brother, his wife, and my cousin Tommy were gathered around the TV watching a movie. Out of nowhere, the candle lifts up from the TV and shoots across the room aiming at my brother's face. Tommy immediately stood up and went to his room. My brother and his wife left not long after that. A few months after this happened, it seemed like the activity died down a little, or so I thought. It was the early afternoon. My best friend and I were sitting in my room. He was watching TV while I was working on my computer. All of a sudden, he jumps up and says, Hey man, I think your grandma just called you. I didn't hear her at all. I got up to go see what she wanted. She said, I never called you. I walked back in and told him that she didn't. Hmm, that's weird, he said. A few minutes go by and I heard her call my name clearly. I look at my friend, this time he didn't hear her. So I got back up and went to see what it was she needed. She looked at me and said, I'm not calling you. My buddy asked me why I got up, I told him what had happened. He said that was strange, that he didn't hear her that time. A few more minutes pass and I'm deep into what I'm doing on my computer. Then we both heard it. My grandmother yelled my name like she was in pain. 
We both got up to see what had happened. Nothing happened. She just got mad at us and told us to leave her alone. She was just trying to watch her shows. The years living in that house took a toll on me. I've been diagnosed with severe depression and bipolar disorder. I've had suicidal thoughts for as long as I can remember. As time goes on, I can't help but think to myself that maybe whatever was in that house has latched onto me. I still get the thoughts, even though I'm taking medication for it. I still feel, not as often as I did when I lived there, someone staring at me. My grandmother eventually died in her room from Alzheimer's disease. And the house was later sold to my father. He is planning on remodeling the house. Me not being religious at all, told him to have the house blessed before he starts. 4. I've been hesitant about posting this, and I'm still not sure if it comes up to the standard on this channel, but I think you guys might enjoy. I'm a 20-year-old female, and this occurred in early summer last year, when I was still 19. I commute to university by bus and by train four days a week. The ride takes me about an hour and a half in total, and even though I'm only in my third semester, I've already seen a fair share of weird people on public transport. This guy, however, takes the cake. And you'll soon see why. The day it happened, I was heading home after classes on a warm afternoon, and the sun was shining. Not at all the setting for something scary to happen, right? For some reason, I had developed the habit of sitting right behind the bus driver's seat whenever possible. And this time I had been lucky. I was listening to music from my phone while half-heartedly scribbling into a small notebook. I always carry one of those in case I come up with an idea for a poem, or drawing or simply have to note down an address. I had just put the pencil away for texting my boyfriend about being on the way home, when this guy got on the bus just three stops out of the town where my university is located. He got on with a bunch of other people, so until he tapped my shoulder, I didn't even look up. He was tall and quite noticeably overweight. He had blonde hair, was probably somewhere in his late twenties or early thirties, and his backpack and clothing were all very simple, and of bright colours. Overall, he looked harmless. He smiled and asked if he could sit next to me. Sure, I answered politely. It was nice of him to ask, yet a bit unusual. As far as I'm concerned, Germans are considered to be rather scarce with small talk. Even more so here in the south of the country. If there's an unoccupied seat on public transport, you usually just sit down without interacting with the person next to you whatsoever. I didn't think much of it, though, and kept minding my business. Until I realized he was trying to talk to me. I had barely heard him before because of my music, so this time I took one earbud out and let him repeat what he said. Nice weather, huh? Yeah, definitely. The stereotype about Germans not being into small talk does match me, mostly because I suck at it. I was tired and just didn't want to interact with strangers at the moment, so I put the earbud back in and tried to look busy without being too impolite. To no avail. Right, I see. Yeah, a student's life is quite busy. I didn't feel obliged to tell him that my poems had barely anything to do with me being an industrious student. I considered pretending to fall asleep at this point, but I had told my boyfriend that I had written some stuff during breaks that day, and he insisted to read them. I didn't want to make him decipher my handwriting on that crappy photo, so I started copying the text into my phone. When the guy spoke up again. You smell good. Now this should have been my cue to be creeped the fuck out. The reason I wasn't was that by then, I had figured he might have some sort of mental disability. Judging by his overall demeanour that didn't quite fit an average adult. And also since he considerably slurred his speech. In 11th grade, 
I had participated in a program where people from my school could spend a week of vacation with students from a boarding school for physically and mentally disabled teens. I had been very nervous in the beginning, but soon realized that I had never had this much fun with people I had just met. I learned that people with disabilities can be the kindest, most fun people and also very clever. And it's a shame how they're often terribly underestimated and overall treated as second-class citizens. So when the guy made it clear to me that he wanted to talk, I was determined not to be part of that experience. I wasn't planning on pretending to fancy conversation, but at least try to understand what he wanted to say and take him seriously. So when he said I smelled good, I took it as a clumsy compliment, and just shyly thanked him and went back to typing. This is when things got creepy. Now, I said he wasn't speaking very clearly. As it turns out, he had trouble putting sentences together too. So, even though I was sure I understood every single word he said, I thought that I was messing up the context at first. I just couldn't believe he told me what he did. But as he went on, it became clearer and clearer to me that he was dead serious about everything. Since the conversation, if you want to call it that, went on for about half an hour and consisted of a lot of unfinished sentences and repetitions, I'll just sum it up for you. He told me about some sort of work he did, where he would clean up a woman's urine from the floor and collect it into a bottle. I just assumed he was working in geriatric care or something. Then he told me about a cellar that he was currently renovating and again, I just assumed it was related to a job of his. That was until he proceeded to tell me that there was a grill or oven in his cellar that he would put women into, first preparing them with cake dough, pizza dough, and all that good stuff. Then he would eat them. He showed me three consecutively numbered pages in a notebook. On the first two pages, he had noted girls' names with their phone numbers. He told me that he would ask random girls on the street for their numbers, note them down like that, and at some point in time, he would call them to ask for their address. He would pick them up at their homes with his company van, place them in the back and drive them to his cellar to bake them in his oven. The third page was still empty. Want to join? My whole body had gone hot by then and my heart was racing. He told me all that in such a casual tone that it only slowly dawned upon me that I had understood him all too well and that he was not joking in the least. I was sure that he was no immediate danger to me and I highly doubted that what he told me was true. But still, I had just been casually invited to be that guy's dinner. I was thoroughly freaked out. I told him that I wouldn't have time to join, that I was busy with my studies. Maybe next year, he asked. No, sorry, I'll be spending the upcoming two semesters abroad, which was not even a lie. He kept rambling on about it, asking me over and over again. I finally told him that I'm not quite into that kind of stuff, and maybe he should try at one of my hobbies instead and go to see some good medieval-themed metal concert every once in a while. Maybe that would calm him down a bit. He finally asked me if I had a boyfriend. I said yes. He said that my boyfriend would probably not approve of me going with him. I said, I guess not. And that was the end of that. He kept quiet for the rest of his ride, and when his stop came up, he left without saying another word. I immediately texted my boyfriend about what had happened. I had at some point put the phone down, too concentrated in order to pick up on the guy's every word, and terrified that if I texted my boyfriend about it, he might realize and get angry. My boyfriend was freaked out, of course. How could he not be? It was funny how only now that it was over, I could fully grasp on what the hell just happened, and I was shaking and panting in shock. I told my mom about it when I got home and considered contacting the police, 
not because of me, but because of the girls in his notebook. As I said, I think disabled people are highly underestimated. What if he was, in fact, able and willing to harm people? My mom talked me out of it, though. That could have been the end of it. But two weeks later, around the same time, on the same day of the week, he got on the bus again and, as fate would have it, sat down next to me. This time he didn't bother starting off with some small talk first. He got right into it, as if he had never stopped talking to me since we first met. This time he repeated a lot, but was also a lot more specific on his cannibal routine. He told me that when he'd pick up the girls, he'd tell them to hand him all their valuables, and then to sit in the back of the van. At his cellar he would give them candy with sleeping drugs inside, and once they were sound asleep, he'd strip them of their clothes, put them, or the clothes I wasn't quite able to tell, in a sack, then put the girls in the oven, then eat them. He was also planning on installing a cold room in order to be able to save some of the meat for longer periods of time. This was it. I went straight to my local police office and told them. I'd rather have some policemen thinking I was crazy than people actually getting in danger because nobody felt inclined to speak up about the situation. I was thinking of naive, shy schoolgirls who maybe let themselves be pressured into giving him their phone number. This time I had remembered that some sort of proof would help. And even though I was terribly nervous about it, I managed to capture almost everything he said on camera. I gave them my statement and the video footage and they told me they'd get back to me. A few weeks later, I received a letter which said they did track him down, and they confirmed my assumption of him suffering from some sort of mental condition. I forgot what condition exactly, but as I had already anticipated, he was classified harmless by his medical supervisors. The case was officially dropped. I was fine with that. I trusted their judgment. In fact, I felt kind of bad for rushing the police on a mentally disabled person's neck. I didn't even know the police would make it an official case. All I wanted to do was to make sure that if girls do start disappearing, they would have a hint on where to look for a culprit. Looking back at it, though, the alleged phone numbers did seem too long to be real. Everything points at him living in a very creepy fantasy. After that, I didn't think too much of it until recently. I did see the guy in the bus again from time to time. He has probably always been around. I just didn't take note of him before the first incident. A few days ago, he got on the bus at the usual stop. This time together with an elderly man. Probably another regular on that part of the route. They sat down close to me on the other side of the central aisle between the rows of seats. My seat was facing rearwards. His was facing in the direction of travel. My special friend and the other gentleman who faced the same direction as me seemed to know each other from meeting on the bus on a regular basis and had some friendly small talk. Now I did sometimes wonder if he had forgotten about me or if he recognized me when he saw me on the bus since I had never noticed him reacting in a particular way. I had assumed the former for the most part. That day, I was going to be proven wrong. I was looking down on my tool of the trade notebook for most of the time, writing only sometimes, subconsciously looking up when I combed through my head for a particular expression. I did that at a point when the conversation of the two men had somehow stopped. Why exactly, I didn't know, but I found myself looking right in the eyes of my special friend. He was staring dead at me, with an expression that was empty and yet gloomy, for some reason. I was frightened and looked back down quickly. It could all have been a coincidence, my brain exaggerating things because of what had happened between us. However, I didn't dare look up while he was there anymore. A few minutes after, he finally got off. The gentleman who had got on the bus with him earlier 
struck up some small talk, telling me that he found it interesting that I wrote with my left hand, but handled my phone with my right hand only. He had been one of the left-handed who had been forced to relearn writing with his right hand, back in the day when school still worked like that. He was a nice guy, and I didn't think much of him talking to me. In hindsight, though, it confirmed to me that I didn't just imagine my creepy friend staring at me. I'm assuming that my special friend's attention just drifted away from the conversation at some point. And out of confusion, the gentleman followed his gaze and became aware of me. It was very unlikely of him to even take notice of me otherwise. I'm sure he was and is entirely unaware of my experience with his younger acquaintance. He probably just thought that something about me spontaneously fascinated the guy. And accepted it, since there's no way he didn't realize he had a mental condition. It's scary to think of how long the guy might have been staring at me, with this look without me noticing. It had been quiet between them for at least a minute. So, creepy guy with cannibalistic fantasies, I really hope you find something more heartwarming and fulfilling to fantasize about. I'll inevitably see you around, but let's, please, not have small talk of that kind again. 5. In 2012, I was living at home with my parents, until I saved up enough money to move out on my own, and when I did, I moved into a small one-bedroom apartment in a decent part of town. I really liked it. It was a New York-style loft apartment with hardwood floors and a spiral staircase. The apartment building used to be an old silk mill, I never heard anything bad about it, or about any hauntings or strange happenings in or around the building. It was more historic and unique than creepy. Shortly after I moved in, I began noticing some weird things. That I, as a mid-twenties male bachelor, didn't give a second thought to it first. It wasn't until I invited a girl, Megan, I was casually seeing over one night that I began to pay more attention to the strange events occurring. We were sitting on the couch watching TV, and I had to use the bathroom upstairs. When I was done, I came downstairs and found Megan standing in front of the TV, staring at the door to the apartment. I froze on the staircase and asked her what's wrong. She told me she heard someone tapping on the door and whispering. I walked to the door and opened it up. There was no one there. I looked up and down the hallway and didn't see anyone. I told her that there were young kids who lived in the building, and they might have just been randomly knocking on people's doors for fun. Megan said no, that it clearly sounded like a woman whispering through the door, and what sounded like fingernails gently tapping on the door. We discussed it a bit more, but ultimately ignored it. A few nights later, Megan came over again, we were watching TV and I swore I heard dripping sounds coming from my kitchenette area. I got up and walked over to the sink thinking I didn't turn it off completely, but it was indeed completely off. I sat back down on the couch and continued watching TV. A few minutes later I heard the dripping again and again I got up. I hadn't told Megan what I heard or why I was getting up, but this time, Megan asked if I heard the dripping sound too. I didn't think she heard it. I said yeah, but that I couldn't locate what's making the sound, or where it's coming from. She told me that every time she comes over to my apartment she hears it. I thought, great, now I have a leak somewhere and I can't find it. But I would only hear it at certain times. That night, after Megan left, I went upstairs to bed, and just as I was beginning to doze off, I heard three loud knocks on my door. They were loud and distinct knocks, the kind that bony knuckles make on a hard wood door. What struck me odd about this was that it was 10.30pm on a weeknight, and I wasn't expecting anyone. But even more strange 
was that it sounded like the knock came from the inside of my apartment door. The way the knocks echoed, considering I have wood floors. It just didn't have that muffled sound that I've heard numerous times from people coming over. I went downstairs, unlocked my door, and looked up and down the hallway, and of course, there was no one there. A few nights later, I was watching TV, and randomly watching YouTube videos. I was especially fond of the new Ellie Goulding song, Lights, and was listening to it right before I turned off my TV and laptop to go to bed. Around 11pm, I woke up to my laptop playing music in the living room downstairs. I was a little concerned now at this point. I cautiously walked downstairs and stared at my laptop, which was closed playing lights by Ellie Goulding. I opened up my laptop and there was her music video playing on YouTube on my laptop. I closed out the YouTube window and shut my laptop off again and went back to bed. About a week later, I was again watching YouTube videos before bed. Ever since the last incident, I decided to ensure my laptop powers off completely before I close it and go to bed. Again, around 10.30pm, I wake up to a slight humming, eerie, space-like sound, looping over and over again coming from downstairs. I get up, and this time I grab my phone to record what I'm hearing, for proof so I can show Megan. I record it for a few seconds, before opening up my laptop and seeing Internet Explorer open with a small pop-up window for an Android phone playing in the bottom of the screen. This being years ago and upgrading my phone a few times, I no longer have the video, but I indeed showed the video to Megan, my family and a few friends of mine who can confirm this truly happened. I turned off the computer again and went to bed. By now I'm thinking I just have an issue with my computer. Even though I had only bought it from Sam's Club brand new the same month I moved into my apartment. And was still making payments on the credit card I bought it with. But then something else happened. About a week later I was again on the couch watching TV before going to bed. I clearly remember watching the movie Tooth Fairy with Dwayne The Rock Johnson. It was about 9 or 9.30 at night, and was about my bedtime. I had two remotes that were completely separate from each other with different purposes. One turned on the TV, and the other turned on and off the cable box. I turned both my TV and the cable box off, and went to bed. Not 30 minutes later, I woke up scared shitless as I heard my TV. I jumped up and ran downstairs to find my TV on with the movie Tooth Fairy playing. This concerned me since both the TV and the cable box had to be turned on separately. Things were getting stranger and stranger. Shortly after this I took a job in Afghanistan as a security contractor, but I had kept the apartment as I still had a lease and kept my belongings there. In April 2013, I came home for two weeks of leave, and had nearly forgot about all the weird stuff. It was a few nights before I had to leave to go back to Afghanistan that I had a dream. I was dreaming I was lying in bed just as I actually was, but was paralyzed. And at the foot of my bed was a gaunt-looking older woman in a flowing loose white gown with grey hair. She was looking directly at me. She seemed to have this weird black glow around her. I know that sounds absurd, but it almost looked like something from an old movie projector. I noticed she was slightly floating and looking down at me from the foot of my bed. Even stranger was that she had black holes with what looked like runny black mascara spreading out from where her eyes would have been. She didn't say anything, but rather just stared at me. I was trying so hard to sit up but felt like something was holding me down. I finally woke up, and shot straight up and looked directly at where her eyes would have been in the air, at the foot of my bed. And I swear there was a slight black glow, but it disappeared quickly. I couldn't be sure what was real or if I was still dreaming. 
I just thought it was strange that if I was dreaming it, how did I know exactly where to look when I woke up? A few days later, I moved out of the apartment and was on a plane back to Afghanistan. I never have been back to that apartment, nor have I heard anyone who lives or lived there have similar stories. But I'll never forget what I experienced. Hey everyone, Hellfreezer here, and thank you very much for listening to 5 True Scary Subscriber Stories, episode 41. And I have to say, that video turned out way longer than I expected. I thought we were looking at about 20-25 minutes, but no! I had to go and record a bunch of long ones, didn't I? Silly Hellfreezer. Okay, of course I'd like to say thank you very much to everyone who sent their stories in. If you have a story yourself you'd like to send in, please send it to kingofthecities at gmail or googlemail.com. The email address is also in the description of every video. Well, we keep getting promised good weather here, and today as I headed down to the local shop, I had snow and hail to deal with, and then I had sun. I think about an hour after that, so that was nice. I just hope we have a decent summer, because there's plenty of stuff I want to be doing in the garden outside. Make it look all, all good again. But if I don't get the weather for it, it ain't gonna happen. Ah, well. Okay, I'm gonna head off for now, so until next time, thank you very much for listening, and take very good care of yourselves. <laughs>